So I've been working on a couple of projects recently and I found myself in the need for a high frequency microwave mixer. This is usually a pretty expensive part and I couldn't find any second hand ones up at the frequencies I needed that were relatively cheap so I decided to create my own by copying a reference design. So this is my take on the reference design that comes with the data sheet of the LTC5548 which is a 40 gigahertz RF mixer made by Linear Tech. And in this video, I'm going to build it. Here's the PCB here. And then after building it, I'm going to run a bunch of experiments on it and see if it actually behaves. So let's go. As I'm putting this together, you'll notice a couple of things. First thing is that the solder pasting job is pretty horrible. It's because I was using the wrong size nozzle and the solder paste I'm using is out of date as well, which isn't fantastic. I'll have to get some new stuff. Um, but it ends up working okay, so. The other thing you'll notice is that there's a bit of a bodge on the ballon on the left-hand side of the board. I created the footprint based on a ballon from mini circuits called the tc 11 m Plus, but the ballon that I actually ordered was the TCM183X+. Plus. I ordered this different ballon because it had better frequency response. This might sound silly, like why, why would you expect the footprints to work? But in the documentation for the evaluation board, it actually says that these two models of ballon are interchangeable, when in fact they're not, and the documentation's wrong. The ballon bodge wires I'm using aren't exactly controlled impedance, but I'm not really worried about that because I don't plan on using the IF at a super high frequency. Alrighty, let's get straight into the experiments. The first thing I want to show you here is what I'm going to use as the mixer local oscillator. Because I don't have a proper RF signal generator, what I'm using here is actually bought of my own. I'll probably do a video about this in the future, but basically this is a uh, 14 gigahertz phase lock loop. I'll include a link to my design for this in the description. It's based on an analog devices chip, the ADRF uh, 5355. For control, I'm using this Tiva development board from TI, and I've written some code on it so that if I press these buttons, it'll change the frequency in uh, 100 megahertz increments. As for the output amplitude of this PLL, it varies from about 6 dBm at the bottom end to minus 6 dBm at the top end, which is actually perfect for us because the mixer requires an input of minus 6 dBm to 6 dBm. Anyway, if I turn that on... You can see that the lights will come on, and then that red light will come on, which means that the PLL got a lock. If I press these buttons, that red light will flicker a little bit, and that's because it's changing the output frequency. The setup I've got here is the PLL's got two identical outputs. I've got one output going into the frequency counter, and the other output going into the spectrum analyzer, so that we can measure powers on the spectrum analyzer, and the frequency on the frequency counter. At the moment, the span's sitting at a center around 2.5 gigahertz, so we've got 1.5 gigahertz on the left, 3.5 GHz on the right, and we're working at 200 MHz per division. So if I go ahead and turn the PLL on, the pretty lights come on, we can see that our frequency's gone up to 2 GHz, or thereabouts. I would actually attribute this error more to the accuracy of the crystal in the frequency counter than the PLL crystal, because the PLL crystal is actually quite good. I'll have to calibrate this at some point. Anyway, I might do that in another video. So, let's have a closer look at the power. Okay, so with the reference level at 10 dBm, we're looking at a power of the 2 GHz tone of 0 dBm, and given the losses in the cable and in the input limiter, I would say that's probably closer to 2 or 3 dBm. So there's nothing wrong with that, but 2 GHz is right at the bottom of the datasheet specifications. So I might actually take this up to 3 GHz, and then we'll use that as our LO for some tests. So if I just press the button here, 2.4, you can see it moving up here as well. So we've got our 3 GHz tone here at about minus 2 dBm, that's probably about 0 dBm in reality, which is fine for our mixer. You might be wondering what this tone over here is. If it existed, it would definitely stuff up our measurements, but it doesn't exist. So this spectrum analyzer doesn't actually have a tracking preselector, which means that because it uses a subharmonic mixer, you get all sorts of unwanted products on your display. And the way you actually tell whether this is an unwanted mixing product is on these really old spectrum analyzers, there's a feature called a signal identifier. So if I actually zoom in on that, and I have to be at less than one megahertz division, so here's that spurious tone. Now if I turn on the signal identifier, you see it actually creates this duplicate. What the signal identifier is doing is it's actually modulating the spectrum analyzer's first LO in a certain way such that if that tone is actually 
a real tone that is within the span that you're actually trying to look at, then you will see the tone represented here, but then also two divisions to the left. But in this case, it's represented two divisions to the right, so this is really a spurious tone. Now, if I look at the actual tone, that is the actual 3 gigahertz tone on the other hand, I'll just scroll over to that, and we have a closer look at that one. See how, when I'm at 2 MHz per division, it looks like a normal tone, but because I've got the signal identifier on, once I go to 1 MHz per division, it turns on the signal identifier, which starts modulating the LO, and so you get this image here. Because our signal identifier tone appears two divisions to the left, we know that this is a real tone. HP actually did sell a tracking pre-selector add-on for this spectrum analyzer, but I haven't been able to find a cheap one, so I have to make do with this. It's actually kind of funky, I don't mind it. All right, so let's do our first test with the mixer. The setup now is instead of going straight into the spectrum analyzer, I've got the output of the three gigahertz synthesizer going into the mixer as the LO. I've just put a dummy load on the IF port because we're not using the IF port at the moment. And then I've got the output, the RF output, going into the spectrum analyzer so that we can have a look at the LO leakage from the LO port to the RF port. Okay, so the tone that we get at three gigahertz out of the RF port is at about minus 38 dBm. Uh, so subtracting cable losses, it's probably about minus 36 dBm or so, and that's pretty similar to what we see in the data sheet. So now I want to take a bit of a look at the conversion loss of the mixer. So I've got this signal generator set up to spit out a 20 MHz sine wave at 0 dBm, and that's going into the IF port of the mixer. And then, as before, we've got the RF output going into the spectrum analyzer. Like before, we've still got our LO feed through here, but if I turn the signal generator on, now we can see our mixing products. Two tones at about minus 10 dBm. If we account for cable losses and say that this is probably about minus 8 dBm in practice, then our conversion gain is about minus 8 dB, and that's reasonably close to what we have in the data sheet. You'll also see these two spurs here, and these are just a result of the nonlinearities in the signal generator. I want to measure the third order intercept of the mixer, and this is just basically a measurement of the linearity of the mixer. To do that, I need two tones that are spaced pretty close to each other. How I'm going to do this is I've got my two-channel function generator and I'm going through a couple of 10 dB attenuators into a power combiner and then I'm going to use that as the IF input. The reason I have these attenuators is because the automatic leveling circuitry in the function generator actually means that if you directly connect these two channels to the power combiner, the channels actually interfere with each other and you end up with the power levels that you set on the generator being wrong. So I need to put these attenuators in there before going into the power combiner. It's just a bunch of end launch SMA connectors basically just soldered together and then in the middle there's this little bridge of resistors. I'll give you a close up shot of that. I've also soldered some copper tape on the back there. That's mostly to make it look nice. It doesn't really do much for the shielding. Anyway, before I actually connect this up to the IF port, I'm going to connect it directly to the spectrum analyzer to make sure that the levels are correct. So my general rule of thumb with third order intercept measurements is that I want the two test tones to be about 20 dB below the uh, P1 dB of the amplifier. So the input P1 dB is about 15 dBm, so I'm going to aim for minus 5 dBm here for the two input tones. I've got one tone here at 20 MHz and I've got another tone here at 20.1 MHz. So they're spaced 100 kHz apart. When we run it through the mixer, any third order intermodulation products we'll see at 100 kHz away from these two tones. Anyway, I'll just correct for the amplitude here. So with channel one, I'm gonna bring that up to minus five. There we go. And for channel two, There we go. And I've got the power splitter connected up to the IF port now. Similar situation to before, we've got the LO feed through at 3 GHz here. And then here we've got our 3 GHz plus 20 MHz, 3 GHz minus 20 MHz. So we're going to find those two tones that we're generating in here somewhere. There's a bit of a closer look, but I'm going to need to take the bandwidth down so that we can see the third order products.
So you can see this third order product, there's another third order product. We're looking at about minus 18 here and minus 68 here. So our third order intercept is about 20 dBm. This is a bit different to what we have in the data sheet, but it's not too surprising because in the data sheet, the difference between their two tones is two megahertz instead of 100 kilohertz. And also their IF is sitting at about 240 megahertz instead of ours, which is sitting at about 20 megahertz. Okay, so we've had a look at three gigahertz. I wanna see how this performs at 10 gigahertz now. So what I've done is I've got a five gigahertz LO coming into the mixer and I've got the internal mixer doubler enabled now. I've connected that pin. And let's have a look at that on the spectrum analyzer. So I'm tuned into 10 gigahertz, and we've got our LO feed through here at about minus 36 or so dBm. And if I turn on my zero dBm uh, signal generator at 20 megahertz, there's our mixing products, and the amplitude of those is about minus 10 dBm again, so again we're looking at a conversion loss of about minus 8 dBm here. So yeah, performance isn't suffering too bad at all up at 10 gigahertz. And just for fun here, I've taken it up to 13 gigahertz. You can see that the conversion loss here is now more like minus 20 dB, which is pretty horrible. And that's to be expected because I haven't installed the matching capacitors on the PCB for above 10 gigahertz operation, so we don't expect it to perform very well. Okay, so the last thing I want to try here is making a poor man's tracking generator. So what I'm doing here is I've got the PLL coming in as the LO, like before, but instead of using the signal generator as the IF, I'm actually using the spectrum analyzer's first LO as the IF. And so if I set the value of the PLL, that is the LO, to the top of the tuning range of the spectrum analyzer's internal oscillator, basically we should get the spectrum analyzer's first oscillator beating against the LO, and that will form basically a really bad tracking generator signal. There are a couple of issues with this, namely that like really I should have a low pass filter on here. I'm going to go from 0 to 2 gigahertz, but I should really have a low pass filter on here. I don't have one on hand, so I'm not going to worry about that. As for the uh, spectrum analyzer input, I've just got it going through an attenuator into a T-piece. I'm going to put some pieces of cable on this T-piece and we should be able to see the response of those. Okay, so what we're looking at here is about 0 to 2 gigahertz. And I've got the PLL turned on, but I'm going to actually tune the PLL to the first IF frequency. So if I bring that frequency up, there we go. So if I just try and adjust that so that it's maximum. Now we've got this really ugly looking tracking signal from 0 to 2 gigahertz. Now if I grab a little piece of cable and I attach that to my T-piece here, then we can see our little dips. And I mean, this is basically acting as a bandstop filter. So we've got a, basically a minimum here at about 450 megahertz or so. Three times 10 to the eight times 0 0.66 for coax divided by our frequency, which is 450 megahertz or so. And that is gonna be our wavelength. Um, but for a bandstop filter, and because we're looking at a minimum, we're gonna to have to divide this by four. So 110 millimeters, 11 centimeters, and that's pretty much bang on. I reckon if I had a proper low pass filter, it would probably clean up all these artifacts a fair bit. Anyway, that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you liked it. Uh, my budget means that I don't really have the best equipment, so it's hard for me to do any really accurate tests, but this should give you a rough idea of how the mixer performs. I mean, it seems to work okay. I might actually order the correct Balan model for if I decide to assemble more of these, and I'll buy the compensation capacitors as well so that I can test up at 14 gigahertz, but I'll do that in a future video, and uh, I'll also be talking about the PLL in a future video as well, so stay tuned for that. Catch you later!